Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar titled Leading the Literacy Turnaround, Strategies and Principles for Developing a Holistic Pre-K through 12 Literacy Curriculum. I'm your host, Jen Poggio, Senior Literacy Services Manager at McGraw-Hill Education. Today we will be hearing from Dr. Sean Mahoney, Chief Academic Officer at McGraw-Hill Education School Group, as she sheds light on today's pressing issues surrounding literacy initiatives and gives us some pointers for progressing our school literacy initiatives and plans, focusing on new ideas for ELA improvement, curriculum improvements. Although we have hundreds of educators online for this webinar today, Sean will do her best to address some of the common concerns and directly answer some of your questions as well towards the end of our broadcast. Before I hand this over to Dr. Mahoney, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping items. This webinar is being presented in listen-only mode, which means you will be able to hear the presenter, but they won't be able to hear you. However, that does not mean that you cannot participate. Please type any questions that you have into the Q&A panel bar, and we will do our best to answer them at the end of the session. Also, please keep in mind that all attendees who remain online through the end of the webinar will be included in our drawing to receive one of three Fitbit Flex activity trackers. We will name the winners in our follow-up email to you and send the prize within seven days of our webinar. For those of you tweeting, you can use the hashtag Literacy for Life. Welcome, Dr. Mahoney. Thanks so much, Jen. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm uh, honored to be here with you all. Um, I definitely understand and appreciate the, the value of time um, and what a commodity it is. So I'm grateful that you're all present today and that we get to connect virtually like this. Um, as Jen said, we'll be monitoring both the chat window um, within the actual um, presentation as well as um, monitoring tweets. So if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to interact through that chat window. Um, my handle at Mahoney SM is also on screen. I'll be responding to any questions or comments after the session. And again, we're encouraging folks to use hashtag literacy for life or hashtag literacy as we engage today. Um, so thanks again for being here. And I thought that it might make sense for us to start with a bit of context. Um, and I have a mentor that always reminds me that with each new age of life, um, we always enter as a novice. And if you think about literacy in the early days, stories were the vehicle that we used to exchange information about ourselves. Uh, at first, there was no printed word. It was oral history and oral tradition. And then with the um, advent of the printing press, we began to interact with words and language um, and texts in a different way. So from the Odyssey to Confucius, um, what we know and what we knew um, was transferred through the written word. Um, what people wrote was our key to understanding, and we knew what people told us, and that was a primary vehicle for our inter interaction. Um, but the truth to understanding, and really understanding the world around us, is not just the text, but understanding those texts in context. And it's about the, the zeitgeist um, that is beyond our time. So certainly understanding the emotional tug of a text in the moment, but also understanding the broader context of that moment from a historical perspective. And so what I absolutely believe keeps that flame of knowing and learning alive is literacy. And in today's terms, it's the network for knowledge. So it is knowledge of self and knowledge of others and knowledge of the world around us. So I think it's important for us to remember that in any subject, so whether we're talking about math or science or economics or literature, the better you're able to understand, the more you can learn and grow. And so literacy really is this process of interaction between the self and text. And when I use the word text, um, I'm thinking of a broad array of text. Sometimes I use the language object under scrutiny or object under study because it's not just the written word, as you well know. Um, and yet, with any object under scrutiny or any text, literacy is that powerful vehicle for the development of communication and for critical thinking. And without that thought and the analysis and communication, there's a breakdown of understanding. And so I see literacy as the cure for that fatal ailment. Um, in other words, we come to work every day committed to better helping people understand themselves in their time. 
And you're all on this call today because you understand that literacy is a key aspect of that work. Uh, and we're committed to both understanding one another, ourselves, the text, and the world around us. So one of the reasons why I work at McGraw-Hill Education is because this commitment drives everything that we do. Um, we understand deeply that literacy is about making meaning and it's the essence of learning. Uh, and that when we think about this in context, we really focus on the science of learning and the art of teaching and how those two things intersect. So when I think about making sense of the world around us, entering each new age as a novice, we're really deeply focused on how learning happens and how the mind develops. So as we move forward today, um, we will stay squarely focused on the learner. We'll lead with the learning um, and those inquiring minds. And as I was preparing for today, I thought, um, you know, it's always helpful to reach out to your network, um, a network of trusted experts. So I reached out to um, a colleague who is a former teacher, principal, um, coach at the district level. And I said, knowing that we're going to be engaging and that I am going to be uh, connecting with 500 plus educators from across the country, what would you say is the most important message about literacy? Um, and she wrote something um, in what was a quick note for her, but really spoke to the, I think, mastery of her craft. And so um, I'd actually like to read it to you. It's probably about 20 seconds or so, but it was so um, beautifully written that I thought it captured the essence of the rest of our session. So she said, literacy is a dynamic interaction. The meaning of literacy is deeply affected by context, personal experience, and culture. This definition has come to be understood as a process of interaction between the self and text. And text can range from the written word to the spoken word to media to environmental print, the items we encounter in our daily lives. This expansion of the meaning of literacy and text is where we find ourselves today. It is the evolution of literacy that informs our interactions. Literacy is a powerful vehicle for the development of critical thinking and communication. That sound familiar? Its importance can never be underestimated, nor should its meaning ever be limited to understanding of the written word. So then, what is the role of an educator as it relates to literacy? The educator is the critical mediator and the guide. Students come to school sometimes confident or sometimes uncertain with a range of understanding of text. And as educators, we unpack this text to support their ability to understand and broaden their process of interaction with self and with text. So when we think about how we're going to spend the rest of the time, um, I suspect that there will be elements of our discussion and interaction today that are going to seem familiar um, and even validating. And if and when that's the case, uh, I would suggest that you get to claim victory for the day. Because what that means is that you and your teams in your own context are applying the science of learning and what we know about best practices in a meaningful way. And the truth is if there was a magic wand that we could all wave or some sort of magic literacy dust, um, we would have used it by now so that we have a populace full of citizens who have high levels of literacy. But the truth is there's guidelines and there's an art to the implementation of those guidelines and there's the nuance of context. So again, uh, what we've tried to do is really put together what we know the best of the research and the best of practice and success stories um, sort of demonstrates and instantiates from a practitioner point of view. Um, so again, my hope is that you're going to feel a sense of validation and we enter each new age of life as a novice and we enter each new WebEx or webinar or virtual session as a novice. So I'm hopeful that there'll be something that's familiar yet also some new nuggets of information or new ideas or new examples. So with that, um, there are some critical objectives that we're hoping to address for today. Um, the first one is really to discuss the why behind the what, um, which we just did. The second thing is to make sure that we establish a common vocabulary for our time together. The third is to make sure that we outline a system view, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means to us, what that means to me, and the elements of that system. We'll actually put that system um, into a theory of action and give you some examples from our academic design work and how we think about those systems of instructions as we're designing and developing and validating, by the way. Um, and then finally, I want to make sure that we're utilizing a case study for success, so learning from those others around us. 
So at this point, what you're going to see on screen is actually a key question. Um, it's sort of essential question number one for today. And it's, what is your common, transparent, and clearly communicated definition of literacy? So this is a point where feel free to light up the chat window, um, talk amongst yourselves, talk with us. Um, we may not debrief everything that ends up in that chat window, but you'll see sort of a trend of how people are defining literacy, um, how they're making that transparent within their communities and contexts, and how commonly um, sort of held that definition is. So we know that communication is often the hardest part, and when we're thinking about establishing a common vision, whether it's at a district level or a school level or even within a grade level cohort of classrooms, establishing a common vocabulary, not just for literacy, but also beyond, but in our context for today, literacy is absolutely important. So for today, um, we will actually do the same. So when we talk about literacy today, I'm pulling on the International Literacy Association's definition. And so what you should be seeing on screen is probably familiar to many of you. Um, and again, this is one of those places where take in and digest what's meaningful and helpful and connect it to some of the new learning. Um, but absolutely, we're talking about literacy as the ability to identify, understand, interpret, really critically think about, um, including create. Um, and compute and communicate through a multiple um, multiple sets of objects under scrutiny and in any discipline, so it's interdisciplinary and across any context. So if we have a common definition, the second essential question that I'd like to pose to the group and that, again, I'm sort of arguing that you pose within your context, so whether that's with other teachers, within your school, at the district, is this notion of systems. So how have you identified, visualized, and communicated the essential elements of your ecosystem as they relate to learning? Um, and again, this could be at any level. Um, and yet, what I'm suggesting is that even if you're leading from the middle, so even if you are a teacher who is perhaps um, in a school or a district that isn't focusing on literacy as part of their strategic learning initiative, perhaps for this year, um, or you feel like for some reason you're the reading teacher who's sort of fighting uphill, um, it's still important that you have that clear, identified, and communicated vision of how this fits into the ecosystem. And what I would say, by the way, um, just when we think about collaboration, which is going to be a key um, aspect of the guiding principles as we move forward in today's session, um, think about some of your unlikely partners. Um, ask yourself the question, who can't wait to help? Um, who is my resource? And it reminds me of work that I did um, when I was in Tucson Unified School District. Um, we instituted an academic reading and writing program over a period of three years. And I distinctly recall that one of the most engaged and one of the um, most active change agents around literacy was actually a PE teacher at a middle school. And she immediately saw how everything that we talked about at the beginning of the session, this notion of self and your ability to connect to the world around you um, was critically important. And so she began essentially being one of the best and most informed champions, moving from a novice in the literacy space to a master um, in very short order. So again, as we move throughout today, think about how you're visualizing and communicating um, across your ecosystem, including some what you might think are unlikely partners who can't wait to help you. Okay. So when we think about a system and taking a system view, that key principle is really at play in everything that we do at McGraw-Hill Education. So when my teams are thinking about the academic design of a program and partnering with researchers and curriculum specialists, trying to really deeply understand all of the factors at play, it's important that we have an underlying way to articulate our model. And so when we talk about a system view, there's some core principles or constructs that we see as critical within a holistic approach to a strategic literacy plan or a strategic literacy initiative. So if we start with those key principles, you can call them constructs, you can call them dimensions, but all three of them um, are on screen right now. So we talk about the key principle or key dimension of core curriculum. We think about the key dimension of implement uh, of intervention or supplemental curriculum. And then we also talk about purposeful curriculum and purposeful elements of the learning system. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means as we move forward. 
Um, in addition to these principles, right, so there's these key dimensions of core, supplemental, intervention, and purpose, really the instructional intent and what problems you're trying to solve. Those all sit within a larger context around strategies. And we see it as critical to have an integrated view of the world where you have strategies that deal with curriculum design. You also have strategies that are dealing with your professional development or your professional learning design. And then also your design for assessment and formative assessment and any type of assessment that is critical in your context, given again what problem you're trying to solve. So if we're looking at this graphic, the, the purple portion, the purpose portion is critically important because it really does go back to getting clear on your intent and having the goals of making sure that you're reaching all learners, that you're instructing with intent, and that you're trying to engage and inspire not just the learners but all stakeholders. And then the interaction of all of these six elements, the six um, different dimensions and principles is really how we start to tease out and unpack critical elements in the day-to-day -day lesson moments and those small sort of intimate instructional moments within a program. So we're going to use this framework and these strategies and principles to anchor our conversation through a few examples. So question number three, right, is really predicated on the fact that you have a, an anchor, you have some sort of system view that you've developed for yourselves and for your stakeholders. And this question is about your theory of action. So what is your theory of action? How have you articulated it? And how is it being tested and revised? So now that you have a system view, how do you put that into action? And how do you test and revise? So this is where I'd like to show a few examples um, from the McGraw-Hill education world. So how are we thinking about our theory of action as we design and develop across all of these principles? And if we start with all of the elements on screen, um, I'd like to kind of focus your attention on this interaction between core and curriculum. And this is a place where I would use the example of reading wonders. And when the team thinks about reading wonders, we had to make some very strategic decisions up front in the design so that we could have a theory of action around how we're handling text complexity in a literacy program. We needed a theory of action around collaborative communication. So again, ask yourself as we're moving through how articulate and how clear and transparent have your theories of action been across your system of stakeholders. So for example, do you have um, a clear theory of action around how you're conducting research and inquiry and how does that play out across all of your ages and stages and disciplines of learning. Um, I'll plant a little seed right now and say that when I um, conducted a case study with a colleague who has turned around um, two schools in her career before joining us at McGraw-Hill Education, the very first thing that she said is a key element, and again I'm giving away the number one thing on our list, but it's alignment. And it's alignment of those critical theories of action. So when you think about core, think about these critical aspects and how you're unpacking the skills and strategies and your approach to things like complex text, inquiry, and where you can create a common vocabulary amongst your staff. If we think about how this plays out in other dimensions of this framework, we want to focus attention on the notion of professional development um, in service of supplemental or intervention curriculum. So here, this is a slightly different example where in our world, we were working on the design of direct instruction. And so we said, what are the critical components here? What are the most important problems that we're trying to solve? What do we know from learning science research? What do we know from curriculum design work? What do we know about pedagogy? And this is a place where we said, look, we really need systematic instruction that's very transparent and that allows us to engage the students and the teachers so when you think about the professional learning community, this is a place where we needed a theory of action around what does in-class coaching look like and how is that playing into our entire ecosystem? What does online coaching look like and what are the right moments and how is just-in-time critical for these teachers? And what are the topics that are most necessary and frankly most searched for? Um, what are teachers and instructors and Every moment um, that someone's in the classroom, so it might be a volunteer, for example, what do they most need to understand deeply about the literacy moments that are happening in the classroom? Um, how might 
a professional learning environment look and what do those online communities look like? How are we engaging them strategically around online data recommendations? So oftentimes you have the data, you know that there is a problem, but you don't know what to do. So how can you leverage the affordances of technology to help with those recommendations? So again, a slightly different context with these principles and strategies, but you can start to see the interaction and have answering these questions very explicitly for the community starts to create a galvanized vision of what needs to be in the classroom. If we move forward, let's take a look at one last example. And this is around purposeful assessment. And in this example, really what we had to think about in terms of our theory of action and our overall approach was how are we going back to that core curriculum moment. So what you're seeing on screen, albeit kind of tiny, is this notion of um, the recommendations and the reporting features for reading wonders. And really there were key questions that we had to ask ourselves during design and development in order to facilitate the implementation that were about things like the ongoing formative assessment moments in the classroom. So in this teaching and learning cycle, what did it look like to do a quick check? And what was the, the type of information that we were looking for? And how did we know how that was going to give us a snapshot in time of student understanding around a particular instructional moment or day in the life of? Um, what did weekly unit quizzes look like? What did benchmark assessments um, serve in terms of their purpose within the program? How are we utilizing a data dashboard? How are we making that information transparent to uh, the individuals who need to share that information? And then also walling off the garden in places where we don't want to share that information, where it could be misinterpreted. So we absolutely believe in the security and privacy of data and so having these conversations as they intersect with your literacy strategy is also a key moment in that ecosystem so how are you understanding the privacy and security issues as well as taking the instructional recommendations and putting it into a framework that's clearly articulated across all of your stakeholders that's both internally and externally so as you're working with parents what is your theory of action around how that data is to be utilized and how do you contextualize it in a meaningful way? So the last example that I'll show on screen here, um, if I go back for just a moment, is actually around how all of these play out within one single aspect of purposeful instruction. So oftentimes we um, engage in conversations with stakeholders. I was in the Boston area um, just last month and was having a conversation with some CTOs and some curriculum directors, um, principals, and one of the questions that came coming up and that was sort of on the table when it came to, to literacy and then in terms of the ecosystem was this idea of digital literacy and how folks should be thinking about the purpose of digital literacy and the purpose of educational technology in a sense. And so this is a place where I started to think about for our discussion today how we could utilize Thrive as that object under scrutiny. And so Thrive in our world was an excellent example where we really got to think about the affordances and the limitations of educational technology. And we started to think about it in terms of some of the, the yes, flexible platforms and the, the ways that we could engage students in a device that would um, allow them things like mobility and ubiquity and constant connection. But really, we went back to what's the purpose from a learning perspective. And so again, we had to think about our theory of action around blended classroom models. We had to think about our um, theory of action related to collaborative moments. What did it look like to do sort of peer reviews and peer collaboration in a shared writing context? And what was the most useful way for the technology to support and enhance what was happening in the classroom? So what are these digital assessments um, that would be most important to the teacher, to the student, that would provide that just-in-time formative feedback, and then also provide deeper moments of engagement throughout the year and throughout the instructional cycle. So when we think about things like English language support, English language development, um, the notion of digital literacy or digital transformation or digital conversion or the integration of educational technology, we're constantly going back to the question, what is it that we're trying to achieve? And what are we trying to accomplish from a strategic learning perspective? And let that drive the decisions. It should be about the learning, not necessarily the devices. 
So you saw this flash on screen just a moment ago. Um, the reason that I put it up is to really think about this notion of then validating those models. So what you're seeing on screen is my team, um, and they actually ask me quite often to make sure that I skip to the next slide, um, which is their avatar version. They, they think that we look cuter. Um, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, but these are the folks who are responsible for the design and development of the instructional materials and tools that we provide. And you can see that we've got technologists and we have applied learning scientists and we have subject matter experts and they represent a team of over 350 people who are focused on instructional design and user experience design. They're former classroom teachers and third grade teachers and chemistry teachers and biologists. Uh, so there's an array of subject matter experts paired with technologists and learning scientists who are really trying to implement the best of what we know about research and build that into the instructional models, into the lesson models, and these series of action that we then validate. Uh, because we know that there are often intended and unintended consequences with design. So what you're seeing on screen is a bit of a snapshot into how we approach that work. Um, this is actually a, a image that I took from an iterative design session that we had in our Columbus office. Um, and again, you're seeing on screen in this image, there's a user experience designer, there's several creative designers, graphic designers, subject matter experts, um, and all of these folks on this particular day were focused on the notion of reporting and a mock-up of what it would look like to have a meaningful report uh, in a math and science environment that would provide teachers with progress monitoring um, throughout a unit. And so these teams were essentially prototyping those designs so that we could take them um, into sessions with students and with teachers and test our theory of action. So the iterative design allows us to essentially um, have a communication vehicle for what we intend. And the iterative research is the place where we validate that information, or in many cases, invalidate it or extend and modify. So we take that prototype and then we go into in vivo situations, classrooms, we often bring folks into our labs, for example, and ask critical questions throughout the design and development process so that we can refine and tune those theories of action. Um, and you know, some instances that we've encountered, for example, around the, the kinds of ways that we represent um, images with text on screen and how we're managing cognitive load. Uh, I recall some instances where we actually were giving something sort of an artful graphic treatment and pairing that with text. And what we heard from the students is that they were trying to make sense of what that artful treatment um, was trying to lead them to understand about the text. So we took a slightly different approach and made sure that it wasn't just extraneous cognitive load, that it was germane and it was enhancing the text on screen. So these are the kinds of what seem like small moments, but they add up over the minutes and hours of instruction um, throughout any classroom experience. So we're really looking at grain sizes that are small, how many words on screen at a time, when you pair it with audio, um, how much information are the students processing when they're ingesting or engaging with the text. And again, the object under scrutiny could be a multiplicity of text, um, all the way to the totality of the experience, which is, is this lesson effective? Is this unit effective? Is this course effective? and what are students learning about themselves as literate citizens. So we're looking at the entire continuum of efficacy. So essential question number four, kind of transitioning from that notion of you have a system and you have a system view, you have a theory of action, and now the question is really about how are you relying on your trusted network and learning from cases of success? And this includes sharing your own cases of success or case studies. So I mentioned earlier that in preparation for today, I was thinking about case studies and I thought about who do I really know that are experts, who do I know who has fresh insight and has sort of lived and walked in these shoes. Um, so certainly in the time that I spent in Tucson Unified School District, you know, we were working with over 40 secondary sites, for example, um, and there were many, many cases where you can see these five words of wisdom um, come into play. And the reason why I put those in quotes is that really these five words represent um, much deeper guidelines and ways of being around the habits that you develop within a literacy turnaround. So in thinking about my experience, I wanted to 
do a bit of a deeper case dive. Um, and so I talked to Catrice Pereira, who is my colleague now at McGraw-Hill Education, but as I mentioned, um, spent time in schools and districts as a teacher, as a principal, um, and successfully turned around two schools. And so when I spoke with her, I said, look, I'd Again, love to get your thoughts on what are the critical elements of any literacy turnaround. And we want to bounce that up against what we know is accurate from the research. And so when I spoke with Catrice, she said, okay, let me tell you some stories and let me give you some examples. So for each one of those, kind of outlined these notions of common and deliberate, ongoing, comprehensive, and collaborative. And when we walked through and unpacked each of these ideas, uh, I alluded to this earlier in the webinar, the idea of common was the first thing that she recommended. And it was she said it was critical, again, from the uh, curriculum alignment perspective. And so she really talked about vertical teaming, taking all of your um, seventh and eighth grade teachers at a middle school, for example, and giving them common time to plan and review student work product. She also talked about the idea of designing and delivering instruction in ways that, again, go back to that common vocabulary. And the example she gave was um, you know, walking into two classrooms and having two math teachers side by side teaching summation in very different ways and using very different vocabulary. And she said, that in and of itself um, wasn't a concern, but the fact that they didn't know that they were doing that and it wasn't a deliberate um, way to scaffold learning and provide a variety of ways into that concept. So for her, this notion of common vocabulary, common alignment, and being transparent and deliberate or being deliberately inconsistent. So know when you're making choices for a particular reason that actually enhance or sort of broaden the array of vocabulary that students will be encountering in any given moment around literacy. When we talked about being deliberate, this was a place where she really suggested that um, the, the professional development aspects of the work were critical. And she focused on the fact that you know, in many cases, particularly in the secondary world, um, she had teachers who were subject matter experts but perhaps didn't have formal training in literacy. And so how did she balance that and what was the professional development plan that deliberately engaged those teachers both in content expertise and the literacy strategies? Um, when we talked about ongoing, this was a place where she made sure that in every professional learning interaction, whether it was in the professional learning communities or whether it was in um, an after-school session with parents or whether it was outreach to the community, that in every moment they were coming back to the core problems they were trying to solve and even using the same language around that ongoing engagement so that the repetition and the constant focus became a tool that helped create that common vocabulary. So there was this interaction between these five words or five dimensions that was important. When we talked about comprehensive, this was a place where she said, you know, I really needed to have an array of evidence. I'm looking at my notes because this is the place where she said, you know, oftentimes you have the data and yet you don't know how to utilize that data or you have a sense, but you need to cross check that with other aspects of the work. So when it came to being comprehensive, she was looking at an array of different artifacts for student learning, looking at both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, she actually talked about having a data room at their school where the teachers would um, kind of use that room as a place to, to cluster and deliberately plan um, an intervention for a student or looking at grade level trends or looking at how students were performing across a strand of literacy. And so having a dedicated space to the comprehensive sort of um, analysis of the data and again a myriad of data. She talked about um, sharing protocols and tuning protocols where the teachers would show up at the table um, literally and bring student work product and they would talk through the learning objective and what they were trying to achieve and how that was aligned to the standard and then they would put the student work product on the table and sort of push back from the table and listen to their colleagues silently taking notes. And the colleagues would look at the student work product and essentially analyze it to see if it was meeting the intended objective. And what did they see that perhaps might have led them astray in a particular writing prompt, for example. And then that teacher would pull back to the table, sort of read back to the group what she heard, and then come up with the, the next steps plan. So having this dedicated and comprehensive space to data and sharing um, was a critical part of her success. 
And that really speaks to the, the collaborative nature. Um, so she was collaborating very deliberately and designing curriculum moments within her school, but then also outside the walls of her school. So she gave two examples around collaboration um, that were key in her mind to improving the literacy of her students. One was leveraging the needs and the interest of the local business community. So in her context, um, there was an ed tech company that had recently moved into the area. And they had a stated mission on a philanthropic note to make sure that students were prepared as 21st century learners. So they were hungry and seeking partnerships. So that was one place where she got volunteers. She had um, volunteers placed at each of the schools who were then vetted in the classroom so that those students had additional co-partners in reading. Um, it allowed the teachers to do more small group work. Uh, and she saw that business partnership as a key aspect of her strategic plan and the overall ecosystem and their theory of action. Um, the other example was with universities. So she partnered with the university. She had interns throughout the year, um, both fall and spring semester, and then utilized interns during a summer reading program that she designed specifically with the university. So this notion of collaboration inside the walls of the school um, and collaboration externally was really key. So I want to be mindful of our time and I'm watching to make sure um, that we've got enough um, time to take a couple of questions from the audience and unpack anything that's here. Um, and so let's just kind of summarize where we've been. We started with these objectives for the session, um, which I'm actually suggesting are more like guidelines. So yes, it's the way we organized our time together, um, but there are also principles for developing that entire um, holistic approach to literacy turnaround and literacy reform. So the first thing that we recommend is that you do discuss the why behind the what. Are you all committed to the same vision? Do we all agree on why literacy is so important that it is this meaning making of self and other and of the world? The second thing that we tackled today um, and that we also are suggesting on a meta note is critical for success in a literacy turnaround scenario is establishing a common vocabulary. Do we all see and hear the same thing when we say the word literacy? And then even unpacking that further into the curriculum and across the curriculum. So the third thing that we talked about as a critical element of this holistic approach is the notion of developing and outlining a system view and then making that transparent to the stakeholders and using that as an anchor for the work. In addition to outlining that system view, having a theory of action around how the elements of that system, how the principles and the strategies come into play in your particular context, and then have a plan for validating or invalidating. So what is your continuous improvement plan? How often are you looking at your, I say data, meaning any record of experience that's showing you progress towards those goals? What are your measures of success? What do you know what success looks like and has that been clearly articulated? So how are you monitoring your theory of action for that system view? And then utilizing case studies of success, uh, looking at others who have been down this road who have struggled with some of these challenges, and then also proactively sharing your successes so that educators are getting a panoramic view of what works um, and places where they can pull from sort of benchmark, internationally benchmark um, examples of what works. So with that, um, and the notion of bringing it full circle and thinking about why we're on this call together, um, it is about making meaning, and that's the essence of learning. Um, that part of what we've done today is look at text on screen, and some of you have been listening to my voice, and yet pedagogy aside, um, we're all here because we're helping and deeply committed to helping people better understand who they are um, and see themselves in the context of their time, and literacy is key for accomplishing that. Um, so. Jen, I'm going to put the question screen up, uh, and I will turn it back over to the team, and uh, let's tackle some questions from chat. So we're going to go to questions. So let's we'll try, try this again. Dr. Mahoney, thanks for, for your, for your uh, slides and your information. And we've seen many great um, ideas here for developing our school literacy plans, and we do have some questions for you. One of our more compelling questions came from Mrs. Parthmore, who is an ELA director in California, and she asks, can you give us a couple of examples of some of the more successful districts who are incorporating these literacy programs? 
Hey folks, I think I'm back live um, and I will say that I was watching the chat window and I actually didn't get any audio for Jen. It looks like um, that started out to be the, the case for some folks. Um, so I'm going to ask if we can type the, the question in for me um, and make sure that I get the gist of it. Aha, it's just coming through for me right now. Um, so the question that I am getting is, with English learners being the fastest growing aha population of students, um, how are literacy curriculum programs addressing their needs as well as those of teachers? Okay, so great first question. Um, whew, um, and I would say it's actually a really important topic um, and one that's probably um, do more than just a, a two-minute um, response, but I would say a couple of things. One is um, look at some of the key literature um, that's in the field right now. So, for example, um, the Council of uh, Great City Schools has a framework um, for raising expectations around English language learners, and that um, document and white paper has a fairly comprehensive approach um, to how schools, again, research-based, um, have seen success in um, structuring their literacy turnarounds for English language learners um, that really support the, the literacy of all. So if I were going to sort of give one recommendation, um, you know, in the, the two minutes that we have on this topic, I would say seek out that white paper. Again, it's um, a framework for raising expectations, and it's published by um, the Council of Great City Schools. Um, I'm going to go back to, I think, the second question, um, which was reluctant writers are common, uh, it, have common problems in today's classrooms. How can real world literacy tools and resources help um, when it comes to motivating and nurturing students? Okay. Also a great question. Um, I think some of the successes that we've seen um, really rely on the notion of relevancy and connections. And so I talked about some of the critical aspects where we've seen high student engagement um, followed by um, growth in student progress and student success. Um, those examples really rely a lot on storytelling. So when we think about relevancy, um, there's this notion of kind of pairing um, visual and digital storytelling um, with writing projects, with um, more sort of traditional literacy projects and project-based learning and engaging students in a, a multimodal environment. Um, we've seen, uh, if I think about some of the examples I shared uh, with StudySync, for example, there's a feature in StudySync that's called Blasts, and that's essentially um, a current event uh, feature where the teacher can determine what gets pushed to the student using the technology um, and what they hold back, but it's essentially um, a, a current event um, that's then wrapped with a variety of texts and activities, and it's highly relevant um, and really encourages collaborative dialogue, um, critical thinking in classroom um, scenarios. In terms of relevancy and connection, I would also think about the notion of collaboration um, and structured collaboration. We talked a little bit earlier about the notion of um, peer reviews and all of the tools, for example, around writing um, that are with guidance and structure, um, allowing students to engage in both synchronous and asynchronous and sometimes anonymous ways um, for the peer reviews. So some of the research um, that we've conducted and that you also see in the literature um, essentially says that the, the digital tools that allow students to provide feedback but without knowing who they are reviewing um, as well as who the reviewer is allows for more accurate, um, more critical, um, and we mean that in sort of an intellectually critical um, fashion because the the social dimension is abstracted for that moment. Um, so when it comes to engagement, um, think about intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation, but really the concept of relevancy and connection, um, both in the research and in practice, are where we're seeing great gains. I'm just checking the chat window to see if anything else has come up. Let's see. Uh, here's one. Um, it says, we have 40 minutes a day for planning. Hmm? Been there. Got that. How do you suggest we manage our time to incorporate your suggestions? Okay, so here's the example. Um, I teach AP Lit, three classes. Yep. AP Language, two classes, and a class of English three honors. Um, I'm always correcting essays. Is this um, only for teachers of other subjects? 
Um, excellent question. So uh, we started the call actually by um, me saying thank you for your time, because this is certainly an example of where time is one of the most precious commodities and how you prioritize your time um, and utilize your time, even when done wisely, um, is a challenge. So I'm going to unpack this a couple of ways, and if it's not getting at the essence of the question, um, just write back in the chat window. Um, but the, the first thing that I would suggest is when you think about managing the time and you have you know, one planning period per day, um, I do think about um, whether or not there are moments to lead from the middle. So um, these may or may not work, but I'm brainstorming aloud with you. Um, one is to really ask if there are any other moments like around the, the school-wide PD, for example, or um, at the, the AP trainings, um, if you're an AP scorer, for example, um, where you can kind of carve off time to work with your colleagues in those collaborative ways. Again, um, it might be a difficult conversation, maybe you've gone there before, but it's always, I think, worth asking about how you can influence the system um, and maybe start to kind of carve off some additional time that would be devoted to other things um, if you hadn't engaged in that conversation. Um, so influence lead from the middle. Um, the second piece is really around correcting essays. Um, and that is heavy, burdensome work. Um, there are some strategies that I've utilized and I know that other districts have um, successfully. I think that notion of alignment that Catrice was talking about and her five words of wisdom is one place where we've seen schools um, really make progress and both keep the focus on literacy, but perhaps um, share the burden or the pleasure. Um, so for example, if you are the only one in the school who is dedicated to correcting those essays um, or engaging in the writing process, um, how might that become a cross-curricular activity with a, a fully integrated um, literacy agenda? Um, that's, that, I'm picking up on that from the teachers and other subjects. Um, again, the, the class load, um, three classes of AP Lit and two classes of AP Language um, and a class of English Three Honors is, is a heavy, heavy literacy, um, I'll say challenge. Um, and so those are two of the ways that I know um, some of the teachers in the district have been successful. We've seen some um, examples around numeracy and literacy, actually, where the schools are working together um, to do exactly what you're suggesting, which is take kind of um, a, a shared approach to those instructional moments. Checking to see if there's anything else in my chat window. Um, let's see. How do we get students and teachers excited about learning? There is an age-old question. Um, it's a good question. Um, how do we get teachers and students excited about learning is the first part. And then how do we develop student literate identities? Um, I'm going to tackle the, the second part first, the notion of student um, literate identities or student literacy identities. One of the, the most powerful um, both engagement and learning um, and literacy moments that I encountered was the notion of a personal literacy history. Um, and so without um, going overboard on details, um, this particular activity, um, and this was probably the early 90s when I first encountered this. So it was um, done on paper and pencil. You can easily imagine doing this um, in a digital environment, but essentially it had tabs. So you took like a salmon colored sheet of paper and overlap that with the yellow, overlap that with the blue. So you kind of had this tabbed history. And what the teacher asked all of the individuals to do, so she did this with a professional development um, learning session and then replicated it with the students. But on each tab was your age and grade. So started at age five, kindergarten, age six, first grade, et cetera. Um, and on each of those tabs, asked individuals to write down what they remembered about their own personal literacy moment and um, asked for any moments. It could have been positive, negative, or neutral. She defined literacy clearly so that the students um, included those environmental um, print moments that we talked about earlier. So it might have been that they actually got a trophy um, from their soccer tournament and it had their name printed on the front of it. Um, so it was any literacy moment across those ages 
that was personally um, and experientially relevant for the student. And then she had the students exchange and turn those literacy um, logs, if you will, those personal literacy histories into short narratives. And then those actually did get extended into um, what was a literacy um, share out day. So they shared their personal literacy, um, personal um, literacy history. And then they also brought in an object or a symbol of their literacy. So some students brought in books, others brought in trophies, some brought in medals, some brought a card that their grandmother had given them, but it was anything that they had to make meaning of that was personally relevant to them as a learner and someone who was making meaning of the world around them. Um, when I think about that question around getting um, individuals engaged and really linking it to identity, uh, again, it was one of the most powerful um, literacy it was designed as a unit, but it was really this introductory moment into building a culture around personal literacy um, that, that I've seen. Um, I'm checking the chat window here. Let's see. What are um, suggestions for fostering the teaching of literacy in middle school and high school grades um, in core areas such as science and social studies? Great question. Um, so there's a couple of aspects of um, this that I would also unpack. One is um, that oftentimes when um, students hit middle school and high school, as you all know, um, the content um, tends to take on a heavier load, gets more rigorous, there's more long form reading, um, and certainly there's a trend towards less long form reading in personal lives or in social media. Um, and so I think number one, um, places where we've seen schools and districts be successful is where they have explicit conversations with students, not just in the English language arts class or the AP English class, but across all of the subject areas around the notion of different types of text um, and really almost treat text as a genre and talk about when you might have long form reading and how that's different and what sort of strategies that you apply. So number one, I think um, being really explicit and, and common in how you approach literacy and engage students in almost those meta conversations around what it means to, to make sense. Um, the, the second aspect of that would be um, science and social studies incorporating the notion of project-based learning and pairing multiple texts for multiple points of view. Um, primary source documents are something that we feel are critical um, in the areas of um, social science um, and really offer multiple perspectives. So perhaps it's student interest um, that might either be an obstacle or an enticement to a particular topic. Um, so, you know, again, think about um, the variety of text, and again, I'm using that because it's the object under scrutiny. Um, think about explicit conversations and metacognitive conversations. And then again, going back to this notion of um, shared moments of instruction, how is the curriculum aligned so that students are seeing connections across the, um, across the curriculum when they move from their science class to their social studies class? What opportunities do you have to create a holistic approach to the curriculum? Um, so that they're not just seeing the connections within a single subject. All right. I think uh, I'm getting a note saying that that is the, the bulk of the questions. Um, I'm going to, to pause um, on the questions. Um, I'll move it forward um, to the closed slide. Um, I know that there might have been a few questions that um, kind of popped up through chat during the session. Um, I know the team did the best um, to answer those questions, but again, if you have anything that you'd like to follow up on um, after today's webinar, please feel free to use the handle at Mahoney SM. And then specifically, if there's anything you would like further information about when it comes to our work at McGraw-Hill Education, if you actually just go to this landing page, um, it'll ask you to click through a request and that'll get you to um, a consultative strategy session with one of our team members. So if there's any topics um, like literacy success stories, if you want to take a deeper dive on um, you know, some of our partner schools, um, anything is fair game. So uh, I will close by saying thank you um, to everyone who joined. Um, I appreciate the questions and the, the level of engagement, and I look forward to um, seeing you virtually again soon. Have a good evening, everyone.